Yeah, Shabbat Shalom everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. We're coming close now to the end of the book of Leviticus, aren't we? And this week's Parsha is called Emo. And in English, this means speak. And as we're drawing near to the end of the book of Leviticus, we've had some interesting themes, haven't we, Have we as we've ventured through the book of Leviticus. But I'll tell you what, this week has got some intense themes. This Parsha opens up with the priest's daughter, if she profanes herself, she's to be burnt. <laughs> then we have um, the priest must, the high priest must only marry a virgin or a maiden. We also have that disabled people can't work in the tabernacle. Um, I mean, what's going on with this Parsha? It's, it's wild, isn't it? It's a bit wild. And if you're not what, looking at this from a biblical mindset, it's easy to get wrapped up in these theories of evilbible.com or people trying to disprove the, the, the scriptures through these verses because the God we serve is love, but you may ask, how is, is, is the God you serve a God of love if, if we see these themes going on in the Parsha? So this is one of the most intense Parshas in the Torah portion portions and I always end up getting them, you know, for some reason. Just have a lot for, bro. <laughs> and, uh, I think I got the captive woman last year. Um, but I'll be honest with you, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed studying this week because I love coming up with apologetics for the word. I love defending the word. And apologetic isn't, like I'm saying, sorry for the word. It's a statement in defense of what's being said here. So today, I hope I'm going to bring some spiritual and applicable, uh, applicable uh, lessons within these laws. So let's get, break into them. And emo, in a nutshell, emo or speak in English begins with special laws pertaining to the priests, the high priest and the tabernacle slash temple service. A priest may not become unclean through contact with a dead body unless the occasion of the death of a close relative. A priest priest must not marry a divorcee or a woman with a promiscuous past and the high priest can only marry a virgin. A priest with a physical deformity cannot serve in the tabernacle or temple nor can a deformed animal be brought as an offering. We later read in the Parsha, a newborn calf, lamb or kid must be left with its mother for seven days before being eligible for an offering. One may not slaughter an animal and its offspring on the same day. The next part of Emo lists the annual appointed times of Yah, which are the weekly Shabbat, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, tabernacles, which ends with an eighth day celebration. Next, the Torah discusses the lighting of the menorah in the tabernacle and temple and the showbread which is to be placed weekly on the table. Emor concludes with the incident of a man executed for blasphemy, the penalties for murder, and the compensation for injuring a person, person or destroying their property. So just intense themes going on there. We even have the eye for the eye quote in this Torah portion, the, the, the famous or infamous quote from the Bible. So we're going to break it down. We're going to look at it. And it's four chapters this week. And the quick overview of our chapters, we're going to be focusing on chapter 21, which is the holiness required of the priests. We're going to be looking at the appointed times of Yah in 23, which is the middle of the Parsha. And then we're going to end on the punishment for blasphemy and break down what I for an I really means according to the word. So this week I've been pressed to tackle the appointed times of Yah as it comes up and I hope this is going to be a, a bit of a Sabbath crash course and I know we've got a couple of experts who've been doing the Sabbath for a while here um, although it's, I think it's important to rearm ourselves as we go through each year so that's my objective today I hope to rearm us all with the appointed times of Yah with the Sabbath and how this applies to us so with that being said, we'll begin the reading in Leviticus chapter 21. Uh, we're going to read the whole chapter of Leviticus 21. 
to get the complete context. And then we'll break it down. Hand it over to you, Tom. Okay, brother. And the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, None shall defile himself for the dead among his people, except for his relatives who are nearest to him, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, and his brother, also his maiden sister who was near to him, who has had no husband, for her he may defile himself. Otherwise he shall not defile himself, being a chief man among his people, to profane himself. They shall not make any bald place on their heads, nor shall they shave the edges of their beards, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. They shall be holy to their God, and not profane the name of their God. For they offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire, and the bread of their God. Therefore they shall be holy. They shall not take a wife who is a harlot or a defiled woman, nor shall they take a divorced woman from her husband. For the priest is holy to his God. Therefore you shall consecrate him, for he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you, for I, the Lord who sanctify you, am holy. The daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by playing the harlot, she profanes her father, she shall be burned with fire. He who is the high priest among his brethren, on whose head the anointing oil was poured, and who is consecrated to wear the garments, shall not uncover his head, nor tear his clothes. Nor shall he go near any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or for his mother. Nor shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor, prof nor profane the sanctuary of his God. For the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. I am the Lord. And he shall take a wife in her virginity, a widow or a divorced woman or a defiled woman or a harlot. These he shall not marry, but he shall take a virgin of his own people as wife. Nor shall he profane his posterity among his people, for I, the Lord, sanctify him. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, saying, No man of your descendants in succeeding generations who has any defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. For any man who has a defect shall not approach. A man blind or lame, who has a marred face or any limb too long, a man who has a broken foot or a broken hand, or as a hunchback or a dwarf, or a man who has a defect in his eye or eczema or scab or as a eunuch, no man of the descendants of Aaron the priest who has a defect shall come near to offer the offerings made by fire to the Lord. He has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. He may eat the bread of his God, both the most holy and the holy, only he shall not go near the veil or approach the altar, because he has a defect, lest he profane my sanctuaries, for I, the Lord, sanctify them. And Moses told it to Aaron and his sons, and to all the children of Israel. Thanks, brother. So quite intense themes, really, to open up the parsha. It's jam-packed with drama, and you can see easily how some of these scriptures could be misinterpreted, especially for those who are uneducated in, in the complete scroll, and can be taken out of context. In chapter 21, we read how someone who has blemishes is forbidden to save by offering to the Lord I am going to cover the, the priest's daughter who was burned, but I'm going to save that till after the break. I just wanted to focus on this section first because this is actually quite a beautiful law. It says, No man of the descendants of Aaron, the priest who has a defect, shall come near to offer the offerings made by fire to the Lord. He has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. So you might think, wow, is that like discrimination? What's going on here? Well, on a practical level, this is very simple to explain. The tabernacle, as we've been learning the past couple of weeks, is a really dangerous job. And people have lost their lives through the power of God for approaching the altar incorrectly. And if someone has a defect, such as it mentions a broken foot or hand, they will be putting themselves and the entirety of Israel in danger if they was to take part of this service and something was to go wrong remember the priests were not only to atone for themselves but also for others it wasn't just so it's a massive responsibility this and to put this into layman's terms there's a reason why there is a medical fitness test to enter the military you know you wouldn't want someone with no fingers attempting to fire a gun in war it could not only hurt 
yourself. It could also hurt others on your same team. And you wouldn't want a blind man attempting brain surgery on you. He physically wouldn't be able, would he? So these laws are put in place for the safety of the greater good that's taking place. And this is the reason behind the law. It isn't discrimination. In fact, it is actually a service for those who can't serve. And it reveals God's character. He teaches us that those who are healthy are to serve those who are not. And it makes so much more sense when you reframe it. In fact, the text says in the next verse, it goes on to say, he has a defect, he shall not come near to offer the bread of the God of his God. Oof, that sounds horrible. Put that on evilbible.com. Next verse, it says, he may eat the bread of his God, both the most holy and the holy. So what this is saying is someone else must offer it for him. Someone else has got to do the work, essentially. But he may still eat the bounty of the bread and doesn't have to bear the weight of that work. Uh, and he can eat the bread of the holy, and the text even goes out, out the way to say even of the most holy too. It's a beautiful commandment. We can apply this to many aspects of our life on how we are to serve others who aren't able. And if we are able, we can serve them in the ways which we are. So it's actually a, it's a beautiful mitzvah. It's there for the safety and to reveal God's character to us. Moving on to the other apologetic now we read in that first chapter he who is the high priest he shall take a virgin or he shall take a maiden one may think upon reading this parsha you know why can the priest only marry a maiden you know that sounds a little wrong <laughs> you know through our culture's eyes we could even maybe label it like foreign and a little bit perverted what's taking place here why is the the high priest to only marry a maiden but we've got to understand that throughout the bible god uses creation to teach us his character he uses agriculture he uses animals he uses the human body he uses all different parts of nature to show his character and his plan for us maidenhood in nature is something unique as it cannot be organically recreated once taken. God's plan in Eden was for a man and woman to only have one partner. And when the maidenhood is given, it symbolizes a blood covenant to that person. And it is used in Hebraic culture to, to show chastity leading up to marriage, then exclusive, exclusivity to one partner. That's what it symbolizes in the Bible. There's nothing wrong about this. God is using something in nature to show exclusivity, chastity to one partner. And to reveal the full length of this in scripture, Paul understood this and uses this analogy in 2 Corinthians. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I promise you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Paul is saying here, be exclusive to Yeshua. Mm. Refrain from anything that can defile you. Mm. With that being said, according to scripture, what is Christ to us? What did we learn last week in Joe's Parsha? What is Christ to us? In Hebrews, we learn, we have a great high priest, Jesus, the son of God. So if we're reading in Leviticus here, the high priest, he shall take a virgin. And then in the, uh, a maiden, and then in the second writings, we're reading we're to be a pure maiden to, to Christ. And then we read that Yeshua is our high priest. Well, now this is starting to make sense. Mm -hmm. The law of the high priest only marrying a maiden is a symbolic foreshadowing of Yeshua, who is our high priest, who serves now in the heavenly tabernacle. Yeshua, the high priest, is to marry a bride that is a maiden and knows no other gods. Mm -hmm. And that, and through the blood covenant, his atoning blood at the cross, we will become one in him. See, this is Genesis, marital language, this. Paul knows this, and in another account, he states, get on this, in 1 Corinthians, he says, or don't you know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, and he's quoting Genesis, the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Mm -hmm. 
You see, this commandment in Leviticus of the high priest marrying a maiden is actually a beautiful law. It's showing how we can become one with him. God is using a law. He, he coded this law into the book of law so we could become one with him. It's so clever. It's genius. This is how if, 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 someone, says, if someone says, oh, we're going to be one with Christ. Okay, show me that in the word of God. He came and fulfilled this law. And this is how he's able to do it. So something which can be viewed as quite wrong or even per perverted is actually a way of how we can become one with Christ. Uh, i just got something to add there in, in regards to the high priest and the, um, the criteria for who the high priest is allowed to marry. And of course, as the scripture you brought, bro, Yeshua is our high priest and we are called to be virgins, chastened unto Christ. So if we look at the criteria, I believe that we can see all the Abrahamic faiths in this. Mm. So if we take a look, it says, the high priest then is to marry a virgin. He shall take a wife in her virginity. So the woman, a wife, is symbolic of a church or a collective unto God. Mm. She must be a virgin, all right? She, she must be unto one God, Yehovah. She must uh, have no other gods that she's been defiled by. So we look then, this is what he's not allowed to take. The high priest, Yeshua, is not allowed to take a widow, mm -hmm. a divorced woman, a defiled woman, or a harlot. So if we take the Abrahamic faith, well, Islam is like the widow. Hagar was sent away, and she had no husband. She was mm -hmm. sent into the wilderness and became like a widow, wow. unable to marry anyone else, stuck with Ishmael. And Islam, they say that Yeshua didn't die on the cross. The Mashiach, they're like a widow. They have not foreseen the death of the Messiah, Hagar, no. wandering around without covering. The divorced woman, that's Judah, because they don't accept Yeshua. They've wow. not yet remarried. They've still been given the certificate of divorce. The defiled woman, that's any, that's any church that's been penetrated by Rome. They've, they've, got, they've, they've, they've got some type of defilement from Rome that's come from them. And the harlot is, is the one that goes with all the other gods. Mm. That's every heathen and pagan faith, including Catholicism. Mm. So we can see the Abrahamic faith there, and, and he's not coming back for any one of them faiths. Yeah. Unless they are a virgin unto Christ, holy and set apart with righteous garments, and that is the bride that he's coming for. That's who we want to be. And we've all in this room been and done other things, but we become virgins through the waters of baptism, we are washed clean and yeah. forgiven of our iniquity. We are born again, and therefore we have our virginity restored. Hallelujah. Beautiful. Yeah, another point, is, that's beautiful, that Joseph. I wanted to raise that point myself. Um, I know Jack could have touched on it, but he said he's going to go on another tack. Mm -hmm. Remember I asked it before? Yeah. Um, but this is another miracle of the cross. Mm. There's so many miracles were performed at the cross, uh, and one of them being the priest cannot marry a divorced woman. You know, and we've been divorced because of our idolatry of basically cheating on the husband. Unless the husband dies. Mm. You know, this is another medical way. He said, well, I don't think has the time or the, the, the verse you realise that how, how are you going to get over that one then? Yeah. You know, I, you've divorced and now, so now what? He said, well, I'm going to give me life. And when I come back, I'm going to take my bride. Remember what Matthew, the book of Matthew says about the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 25, 1, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. <clears throat> so if we are to be like virgins, symbolically, who are the betrothed to the bridegroom, Yeshua, I think it's important now that we unpack the appointed times of the bridegroom if we claim to be his bride, because this Torah portion, it's quite interesting how it lines up. Because um, we're going to move over chapter 22, as it has similar themes of pre present yourself as holy, as set apart, even your offering to be set apart before coming before at Elohim. But in chapter 23, we read the most detailed chapter in the entire Bible of Yah's biblical appointed times. And I don't believe it's a coincidence that the Parsha is laid out this way. We read of the priestly conduct of the bride, and then we have the bridegroom dance. These are, this, is, this, is, this isn't a coincidence, this. This is how it's been laid out by our, 
by our maker. So with that being said, we're not going to read all of chapter 23 because it's it's quite big and I'll save the end Tommy's lungs. Um, but there's a point I want to make with how this maidenhood leads into the feasts. So we're just going to read a couple of verses of the feasts. Um, if we can go to Leviticus 23 verse 1 and we're just going to go to verse 3. And if you'd be kind enough, Tom, when you're ready, if you could uh, take it away. Because it's important here to highlight how this chapter opens with the Sabbath. And the Sabbath actually being a part of the feasts. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. Six days work shall be done, but the seven days of Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Thanks, bro. So this is the famous chapter now when we get into the seven feasts. But before we do, it just opens with the Sabbath. And as we see, we can go through Leviticus 23 and it titles all the different feasts. But it got me thinking, why does the feast in Leviticus 23, why does the chapter of the feast, the appointed times, why does it open with the Sabbath? Why, why is this the case? And I was meditating on this through the week, and I believe it is because the Sabbath is interlinked with all the appointed times. From all the people who I have met on this messianic war, I would say the revelation of the Sabbath was the beginning of their journey for the majority of people, like without question. Uh, people who are sitting in this room, who are watching online, they've come to the knowledge and understanding of the ancient paths through the Sabbath. What is it about the Sabbath that makes it special though? Why isn't it zitzit, zitziot that we come? Why isn't it head coverings? Why isn't it the feast? Why is it different aspects? Why is it the Sabbath? Why is the Sabbath so special? I want to know. Is actually because our God blessed and sanctified this day. The Sabbath first appears in Genesis when God blessed and sanctified the day. And what did he do after he blessed and sanctified it? He rested from all the work that he created. To sanctify something means to make it holy. This day, just like the instruments in the tabernacle, have a divine presence about it. Seven in Hebrew means completeness, as we've, as we've learned in the past. It is regarded as a perfect number in Hebrew. If you can imagine the menorah of the seven branches, you've got three one side, three the other, and then one in the middle. It's, it's perfect. It's, it's perfectly balanced. It's a complete number. And it's God's signature way throughout the Bible. And it's significant for us in this portion to understand the dance of the appointed times as the bride. Because God blessed and sanctified this day and it has rippled throughout time and it is part of the timepiece in the sky. Even if we try and change the date or change the length of the week or change the Sabbath, the clock in the sky says otherwise. The stars, the sun and the moon are a witness. And I want to show you today with a visual representation of the rhythm of his timepiece to reveal how supernatural the Sabbath is. So this is just, there's nothing esoteric about what I'm about to show you here. This is just a um, visual imagery that I put together to show you how special the Sabbath is. This is really uh, a divine day. And if Yah blesses something, it's gonna be blessed. So let's unpack this. Let's have a look at this. How is, how is this Sabbath so divine? Well, it's from the number seven. If we look, as we know, so every seven days you have the seventh. Um, on the seventh day, you have the Sabbath. Every seven days, you have the Sabbath rest. Once a year, we count seven weeks or seven Sabbaths to Pentecost, awaiting the harvest to be ripe for its bounty. We're counting the omen now, aren't we? In 12 months, there are seven appointed times for holy convocations and gatherings. Every seven years is the Sabbath year, also known as the Shemitah year, where bond servants are set free 
but also where you couldn't harvest and had to trust in Yah that year. We're going to read next week that um, Yah says in the texts, don't worry what you will eat on the seventh year because he'll bless you on the sixth so that your, 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 your produce will be overflowing on the seventh and last year till the eighth, symbolic of the Sabbath. Next, after the seven Sabbath years, we have every seven Sabbath years is the Jubilee where all debts are forgiven, bond servants are set free, the shofar is blown, and any of your family's land that was taken through poverty is restored. <laughs> Lastly, there are the 7,000 years of creation. We read in the word, one day is as a thousand years to God. Therefore, seven days in a week would make 7,000 years, and Christ will reign for a thousand years for the seventh day, also known as the Millennial Kingdom. The Sabbath number seven is interconnected with all the, these appointed times. You can't separate them. And I like to view this chart like the middle is the sweet nectar of a flower. It's the middle part of a, of a flower. Many different petals that come out but they all lead back to the center, which is the Sabbath. Therefore, all these blessings that were what we read about pertaining to Pentecost, the Sabbath year, the Jubilee, the Millennial Kingdom, all these things that we read about in the Word can be experienced on this day. Seven, seventy, seven hundred, seven thousand. In Hebrew thought, these numbers all overlap. This means the Sabbath today is an appointed time where God invites us to start living as we're already in the kingdom. This is how divine this day is. We experience like we're living in the kingdom today. We feel his rest because it's the Sabbath. We experience a sacred assembly. It can be a solemn day, like it's the day of atonement, but it can also be a celebration like it's tabernacles. We see people bring all different dishes and the best food and those are on the food rotor. They go all out to bring the best produce. Well, that sounds like we're leading up to Shavuot to me. That sounds like Pentecost when the, when the harvest comes in and we all get to share of the harvest. We see people have freedom on the Sabbath, don't we? Have witness freedom of people on the Sabbath, whether that's through deliverance, when they've received prayer, whether that's through just sitting here and reading the word and being convicted and returning back to his ways. I've witnessed freedom in a way where I don't work on the Sabbath here. I've got no priorities. I can put all my finances to one side because the Sabbath, I'm resting in the Sabbath today. I'm no longer a bond servant. What's that a picture of? That's a picture of the seventh Shemitah year. We experience it all now on this day. It all overlaps. I don't work on this day and I also I'm also not a taskmaster and make others work on this day. Because this day, remember, in the millennial kingdom, Yeshua's going to be Amen. the king. I've witnessed people come to the knowledge of their inheritance in Christ, like it's the Jubilee. I've seen that in this room. I've seen that on the Sabbath. People thinking, wow, I'm Israel. I've got inheritance. I've seen them come into the knowledge of their inheritance in the kingdom. The Sabbath's a sign. I've seen renewal, revival. It's about family. It's about identity, healing. All these different themes that we read over all these appointed times, we can all experience on this day. And that's the divinity of the Sabbath. There's a website there for anyone who wants to check it out. Um, the sevens in the Bible .com. <laughs> And he's only got, I think, to the book of Kings. And I was reading through them and there's about 400. And he said he's working his way to Revelation. Mm -hmm. It's took him seven years so far. <laughs> uh, no, he's uh, <laughs> no, he's uh, yeah. It's a brilliant website. It's been going on for years, and people comment, and they add all different sevens, and yeah, it's 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 incredible. It's refreshing, and this is why I believe when people are coming into the knowledge of this messianic movement, Torah observant movement, whatever you want to put a label on it. It's the Sabbath movement for me because people are coming into the understanding of this freedom and deliverance that's taking place here. And when I say the Sabbath, it's also the other appointed times as well, his Moedim. 
And as prophesied in Isaiah for the millennial kingdom, we read that the law will go forth from Zion. We experience this today because we're all here today reading from the Tanakh, reading from the Torah and the prophets, reading from the book of the law. This day is truly blessed and sanctified. And according to the Gospels, Yeshua proclaims his ministry publicly on the seventh day. Remember, what does he do? He goes to the synagogue and he reads from the prophet Isaiah. And what does he say? He says, God has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. What is the year of the Lord's favour? The Lord's favour. The year of the Lord's favour is the ultimate jubilee when he returns. Yeshua said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, meaning he is the Lord of rest. Shabbat Shalom, peaceful rest. We can rest in him. The Sabbath is all about Yeshua because he is complete. He is that complete number seven. And all these appointed times, as we know, point towards him. And we can all experience them in some way today. Yeshua's first coming was on a jubilee. And I believe according to Isaiah 61, his second coming will also be on a jubilee. Does this mean because Yeshua is our rest that we are no longer to observe the Sabbath? No. Yeshua in the gospel speaks in a future tense. Post his resurrection, he's speaking here and he talks of the events of the common tribulations and he states, pray that your flight will not occur in the winter or on the Sabbath. Why would it be a burden for your flight to occur on the Sabbath if you were not to observe the Sabbath? The Sabbath isn't done away with, it still stands. It doesn't make sense. Why would Yeshua give us this information? Of course, we are still to observe the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the appointed time where we rest in him. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is going to be the Lord of the Sabbath in the, 7, 000, in the seventh year for the thousand millennial reigns, the king. He is going to be the Lord of the Sabbath because he's going to rule with a, with a rod and staff. Therefore, according to the scriptures, let's remember this day. Let us rest. Let us not buy or sell. We must not work. We must not make others work either. In the Bible, you're not even allowed to make your animals work. And we must have a holy gathering, a holy convocation, as the scriptures say. The Sabbath and a new day starts from sundown. There's some discrepancies online. Some people believe it starts in the morning, but this can be easily proved with Yeshua's burial. In Luke 23, we read, this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and he took it down and wrapped it in linen cloth and laid him in a tomb cut into the rock where no one had ever lain. So this is Yeshua now going into, his, into the tomb. What does it say? It was a preparation day and a Sabbath was about to begin. This is how we know that the Sabbath begins on sundown because they rushed to get him into the tomb. You see, Yeshua's body was placed in the tomb just as the sun was setting. The high Sabbath was about to begin. So if you're working a job or making others work or buying or selling past Friday sunset or before Saturday sunset, consider that this is a test that has been given to you by Elohim to see where your heart stands towards the covenant. And it isn't easy. It really isn't easy. If you are in a job that does trespass the Sabbath, I would advise seeking every opportunity to change that as our Father wants to be able to bless you in his fullest. And if you need some inspiration on keeping his commandments and the Sabbath, I'd advise anyone, a remedy for that is to go and read the book of Maccabees, the first Maccabees, um, and you'll quickly realise that there was people who gave their life, who was being tortured, just so nothing unclean would touch their lips. So if anyone is struggling in faith on that, that's your homework, go read first book of Maccabees. Isaiah 56, verse 2. This is what the Lord says. Maintain justice and do what is right. 
For my salvation is coming soon. We know who that is. And my righteousness will be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without profaning it and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Yeah, I want to bless you. <laughs> this is why. And once we step into this calendar, once we step and get into the rhythm of the clock in the sky, he is, he is able to bless us. That is the first Bible that's written in the sky, did you know? It, it, in the book of Revelation, it describes the stars as a scroll and they roll back. That was the first Bible that was written. And in that sky, it all speaks about Yeshua and his coming. That's what the feasts are. That's what the sun, the moon, the stars are. They all point towards Yeshua. We've just forgotten how to read it. We've forgotten the language, that's all it is. But we're getting the knowledge now. We're starting to learn. We're starting to le learn this language again of how to discern the times, how to discern what the stars mean. This is how Adam knew and had hope that a Messiah was coming because he lived in the garden. He walked with God. And he would have passed this knowledge on from generation to generation. They knew that. I said, how, how did Isaiah know? My salvation is coming. How did he know? He didn't have the New Testament. He, he, he doesn't have Jesus telling us that he's coming back. It's because it, this was passed down through generation to generation. And it's written, literally written in the stars, the fair scriptures. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without profane and keeps his hand from doing any evil. With that, we'll end the first half. Bless you, brother. Hallelujah. Shalom. Welcome back. In the first half, we looked at the sanctity of the Sabbath and how it's blessed and the divinity of it, really, of how it's like this ripple throughout time and that we can experience. All the characters attached, all the character attached to the Sabbath, whether that's the Shemitah year, the seventh year, the Jubilee, we can experience all that. Um, on this day and this off we're going to unpack the burning of the priest's daughter who profanes herself which as I said in the first half is pretty intense upon initial reading but to get the full context of this Parsha we're going to read the final chapter now of the Parsha and it's chapter 24 because I believe there's a theme here that's getting shown and I hope to reveal to you all today. So we're going to go from Leviticus 24.1 and we're going to go right to the end. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to make the lamps burn continually. Outside the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting, Aaron shall be in charge of it from evening until morning before the Lord continually. It shall be statute forever in your generations. He shall be in charge of the lamps on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord continually. And you shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes with it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial an offering made by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place. For it is most holy to him from the offerings of the Lord made by fire, by a perpetual statute. Now the son of an Israelite woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel, and this Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought each other in the camp. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed, 
And so they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shulamit, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. Then they put him in custody that the mind of the Lord might be shown to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take outside the camp him who was cursed. Then let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. Then you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin, and whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the stranger as well as him who was born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. Whoever kills any man shall surely be put to death. Whoever kills an animal shall make it good, animal for animal. If a man causes disfigurement on his neighbour, as he has done, so shall it be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he has caused disfigurement of a man, so shall it be done to him. And whoever kills an animal shall restore it. But whoever kills a man shall be put to death. You shall have the same law for the stranger, and for one from your own country. For I am the Lord your God. Then Moses spoke to the children of Israel, and they took outside the camp him who had cursed, and stoned him in stones. So the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. Thanks, brother. That's the final chapter of our Parsha, as it concludes there with the stoning of the man who blasphemed God. And we end our Parsha by reading the infamous an eye for an eye saying. And unfortunately, this saying has been used throughout history to seek vengeance. Although it is actually a law designed for compensation. An example of this would be if you were to work with machinery and your employer didn't maintain the machinery and you were to lose your hand as a consequence of faulty machinery. By law, you will be compensated for the loss at the employer's expense. And this is what the Lord is really saying here of eye for an eye. It's not saying because you've lost your hand in work, go and take off your employer's hand. (laughs) But it's saying your employer should compensate you for the loss that you've endured. It is actually righteous recompense But as all scriptures and other scriptures, they're being twisted and manipulated to seem something quite evil. When it's not, it's righteous. This is recompense taking place here. It's almost like insurance. It's a bit of a health insurance that's going on here. The first health insurance you're going to read about in ancient texts. So I just wanted to clarify that before we moved on. And... As a whole, I view this partial like a, a, a bit of a sandwich. The beginning states the conduct of the priests in chapter 21, including the priest's daughter. And then we have the centre of the sandwich, you could say, which are the appointed times. Then we end on a seemingly random place segment of scripture pertaining to the punishment of blasphemy. And then we have like recompense, eye for an eye at the end there. And what's fascinating about the law for this penalty of blasphemy is that it uses the example of a son who has an Israelite mother and an Egyptian father. You know, why would the text include this detail? It goes out the way to tell us the, <laughs> the identity of these fathers. Why? Why? To me, the word is trying to show us the punishment for those who are grafted into the faith. As we know, Egypt is a picture of the world. It's trying to show us that this is just as important if you are blood-born into this. There's still a punishment that leads to death. And it got me thinking, I was meditating on this further, so I was like, so what is blasphemy? What's taking place here? And blasphemy is a great disrespect through something being said or done to God or to something holy. So with all this in mind, of this sort of sandwich of our parsha. Keep in mind, at the start, we had the burning of the priest's daughter who who profanes herself. Then we have someone who speaks blasphemy and is stoned to death at the end, but they're not the priest's daughter. The the bit of a... The text goes out out its way to say that the father's an Egyptian man. So what's all this meaning? We're going to break down the burning of the priest's daughter now. 
And in Hebrew tradition, cremation is forbidden. It doesn't say it specifically in the Bible, but traditionally, in, in Hebrew tradition, it is forbidden. And it is a dishonor to the body. And in this context of the priest's daughter, it is used to wipe out all memory of that person, even down to their bones. Remember, we know biblically the bones of a deceased still have honor because Jacob made his sons swear that they would what? Take his bones out of Egypt um, when they left. The sons of Israel, they swore, when I pass on, take my bones out of Egypt, please. So there's something quite interesting with the bones where, as we see with cremation, there's nothing left. It's, it's, it's complete desolation. Um, we get a scripture to confirm the spiritual significance of a person's bones. In 2 Kings, it says, Once, as the Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. And as soon as his body touched the bones of Elisha, the man was revived and stood up on his feet. I mean, <laughs> wow, what, what, a, what a scripture we get there in the book of Kings. There's something spiritual attached to Elisha, who was a prophet of the Most High God, who had amazing gifts in the spirit. Even his bones, after he's deceased, had, had power to resurrect. This emphasizes further how harsh of a punishment this was to burn the priest's daughter, who was a harlot. On a surface level, then, the apologetic can be used that the law of burning was of a deterrent. And this is a deterrent that we did see that worked in the Bible because we do not read of any priest's daughter who was actually burned with fire because she played the har harlot. I scanned the Bible. I done my keyword searches. I couldn't find it. I searched all the priests. And the surface level, you get this apologetic, okay, it's a deterrent then, but I wasn't, I wasn't happy with that. I wasn't happy with that being in the word just as a deterrent. I, you know, it didn't sit right with me. I wanted more. I wanted the meat of this. So why is this commandment in, in the word of God. The burning of the priest's daughter who profanes herself has a deep revelatory message and is a code written into the Torah that is actually a self-fulfilling prophecy for those who are willingly want to profane themselves by playing the prostitute. And this is what we're going to break down now. In last week's Torah portion, for those of you who read it, this, wasn't, this scripture wasn't brought up in, in the past yet, but it, it was in there. And it says, The priest will then sprinkle the blood on the altar of the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting and burn the fat as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Then it states this, They must no longer offer their sacrifices to goat demons <laughs> to which they have prostituted themselves. This will be a permanent statue for, for them for the generations to come. So this scripture here shows that according to the word, you can actually go after other gods and it's classed as a spiritual prostitute. This is what the word describes it as, going after goat demons, other gods, you're actually being a spiritual prostitute. So with all that being said, we fast forward now to Revelation because I'm scanning through the entire Bible. I'm like, why is, it, why is this law in there? Why does the priest's daughter have to be burned with fire and it never takes place? It just doesn't, okay, it's a deterrent, but where is it? Well, when we fast forward to Revelation, what do we get? We get the image of the mother of prostitutes, the whore of Babylon. Mm -hmm. Revelation 17, 3. And the angel carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness where I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast and was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. She held in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead a mysterious name was written, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. 
I could see that the woman was drunk with blood of the saints and witnesses for Jesus, and I was utterly amazed at the sight of her. What happens to this woman? Let's read on further. Revelation 17, 15. Then the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute was seated, the harlot, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, and the ten horns and the beast that you saw will hate the prostitute. They will leave her desolate and naked. The beast will turn on this prostitute and will eat her flesh and what? Burn her with fire. And the woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. There is only one great city that has this level of capacity and influence to rule over the kings of the earth throughout the ages. And that is Rome. It's the Roman Catholic Church. And this is a... The Roman Catholic Church is a self-proclaiming priest's daughter who is going to be burnt for being a prostitute according to the Torah. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The Roman Catholic Church claims to be the daughter of the high priest Yeshua. We've learned that Yeshua is our high priest and speaks with authority as if they are offspring of the high priest, changing the times and seasons, although they have been a prostitute with other religions and spoke blasphemy according to the word of God. Remember the definition of what blasphemy blasphemy is if you forgot we're going to come back to it and in the image you can read in the back together faith of the world unite they might as well just be saying become one one flesh it might as well be saying <laughs> the beautiful timepiece what we looked at in part one has been changed by the catholic church Throughout history, the Roman Catholic Church has persecuted and hunted down and murdered anyone who has observed the Sabbath. There's a teacher in Wales called Mike Fryer, and he's a part of the Father's House. He used to be a detective. That was his full-time profession. And he's wrote a book on how the Catholic Church hunted down the last remnant of the Sabbath keepers 100 years ago in Wales. It's, 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 it's incredible. The Catholic Church has been on a, on, a, on a purging mission. That's what they've been on. Our sister Chiara will tell you about the, the Messianic believers in Italy, who, was, who, was, who she believes was running from the Catholic Church. This was global. It was across the, the earth, this was. And what's fascinating about all this, Catholic theology can actually be read in their handbook to reveal the truth of the matter. We're going to read a Catholic theology handbook right now. And this is what it says. This is a question. Which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, AD 336, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. This wasn't ordained by God. This was ordained by a council of people. God never said to change the Sabbath. What we read in the handbook, it is men who change the day, but not God. So what spirit are they working in? What authority are they working in? If this is in their handbook, what spirit are they working in? Revelation 17, 3. We read, we read about the beast with seven horns, the dragon on the screen, uh, sorry, 10 horns. It had seven heads and 10 horns. Well, funny enough, if we go to the book of Daniel, we read of a beast that has 10 horns. Let's see what the intention of this beast is. Daniel chapter seven. This is what he said. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth, different from all the other kingdoms, and it will devour the whole earth, trample it down and crush it. And the 10 horns are 10 kings who will rise from this kingdom. After them, another king, different from the earlier ones, will rise and subdue three kings. This is the intent of this ten-horned beast. He will speak out against the Most High and oppress the saints of the Most High, intending to change the appointed times and laws, and the saints will be given into his hand for a time and times and a half time. This is the spirit what the beast and the whore of Babylon are running in. It is an antichrist spirit. Bingo. 
And I've heard people argue the case like, yeah, but why does it matter? It's just one day. You're just changing it from Saturday to Sunday. It's only one day. You know, what's the big difference? Well, if you've got a clock and you've done a slight change on a clock, the slight change on a clock makes us forget how to tell the time. And this is what's took place. The slight change in the clock makes us forget how to tell the times. Because with this, in 300 years later after Yeshua, 300 years later, once, once the Sabbath got changed to Sunday by the decree of men, we started to forget the time. We forgot, started to, we, we, we forgot how to tell the time. And what happened? The weeks changed from the beginning on um, w w the beginning of the week was meant to be Sunday. It changed to Monday. Seven Sabbaths to Pentecost is replaced by 40 days of Lent, which is un an unscriptural appointed time. The seven appointed times are replaced by Christmas, Easter, Halloween, Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day. We can keep going. We forget the command of the Sabbath here and no debts are released. All these big corporations are forgetting this one. <laughs> and no land is given back in the Jubilee. We forgot how to tell the time. Before we know it, we have a false worship system. And this is why when we've all come to the knowledge and truth of the Sabbath, we've all, it, there's been a light bulb go on. And this has been the, the start of a thread that just keeps unraveling. Yeah. It keeps going. If you're still keeping Sunday as your sacred day, be a Catholic or not, you need to consider because through, if you're keeping it through ignorance or not, you are still falling under this man-made law that was enforced by the Catholic Church. It doesn't matter if you're a Protestant, it doesn't matter if you're an Evangelical, it doesn't matter if you're a Pentecost. If you're still observing the Sunday and, and taking your family to church on that day, by default, you're following that decree that took place in 300 AD. That's what you're doing. You may not observe, we, we may not be forced to observe, should I say, on the Sunday anymore, but it is through it is being forced upon us through false doctrine. This is what's being forced upon. Can I just add as well? Yeah. <clears throat> because a lot of people say, well, we can worship the Lord any day of the week. And that's right, you know, we worship the Lord <clears throat> on the first day of the week, likewise. But it's uh, it's the fundamental rejection of Sabbath in exchange for Sunday. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I think that's the statement because I, I worship you on Sunday, mm. whatever, yeah, of yeah. course. We can have fellowship and an assembly on Sunday. I think the, the the fundamental rejection of Sabbath in exchange for Sunday is when you fall under um, what the, what the beast of Daniel yeah. has, has come to by do. default, and 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 as we read in the handbook, the solemn the solemnity I can't pronounce that word solemnity that's the one solemnity. This means a ceremonious observance of an occasion or event, and this is what they say in their handbook. If we go back, this is what they say here. They change the sol solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. And you think, oh, that's a bit of a fancy word. What does it actually mean? Well, what it actually means is it, it's the ceremonious observance of an occasion or event. If your ceremonious observance is on a Sunday, if that's the day you go out your way to gather, you are under the rule of a Catholic man-made law. The law which has the spirit of the mother of prostitutes attached to it. It's a bit like when Christmas was brought in, originally disabled. We're celebrating the, the birth of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And now, now it's just a, a big party. Mm -hmm. See, so there's not, Jesus is not even in it anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's how you bring it in. Yeah. And it's the same with the Sunday. Oh, well, no, this is the Sabbath now. And then... Everyone's working. <laughs> only a couple of generations ago, the Sunday, everything would stop still. It would be a Sabbath in Babylon. But now nothing's changed at all. So now it's just another day. But this is how they do it, you see. Do you bring it in something and say, oh, it's because of this? And then after a while, they just remove the holiness of it, the so-called holiness. Do you reckon one day Cyber Monday might be when everyone gets the chip? <laughs> <laughs> could be. It could be onto something there, It could right? be right, yeah. Oh, look, we've got a bargain. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, you, have, you have got a bargain with the wrong guy. Yeah. Yeah, it could be right, but that's how no, it's but done. What, what, yeah, you, you, thanks, gents. And this leads into what I'm going to say next, because the mother of prostitutes wants to defile what the Lord has sanctified. Mm -hmm. And to sanctify something, as we've looked at, is to make it holy, set apart. Mm -hmm. So to change the day of worship to a common day of the week. 
Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> It's blasphemy. That's what it is. It's, it's blasphemy because what you're saying is Sunday is now a holy day, but that's a day for common purposes. What's the definition of blasphemy? It's when you're taking something that's holy and using it for the common or profane. So whether you are the daughter of the high priest or grafted in and your mother is an Israelite, your mother's Jerusalem, that all, you know, all, all the Sunday church will go, amen, our mother's Jerusalem. It is still blasphemy and there's still a penalty for blasphemy and I'm not calling out everyone, I'm calling out the system. This is case by case scenario. The scriptures say let everyone work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. The scriptures say also don't say who goes up and who comes down. That's not for me to judge but I'm saying the system and if you're in the system you need to consider. It is blasphemy and this is why I believe these two instances are mentioned in the same partia surrounding the feasts. Either side of the feasts, the blood born or the grafted in, there's no excuse for blasphemy. Taking a day what is holy and changing it to a common day is what blasphemy is. I've got a couple of slides to go now. I wanna reveal this one to you. Revelation, all the nations have drunk the wine of passion of her immorality. The kings of the earth were immoral with her and the merchants of the earth have grown wealthy from the extravagance of her luxury. Then I have heard another voice from heaven say, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins or contract any of her plagues. Mm. This reminds me of Matthew 7, 23. Because you could say, Jack, that's really harsh. That scripture in Revelation is so harsh. Well, if you think that's harsh, listen to what Yeshua says. Yeshua says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This is marital language. This is the, the, the theme of the Parsha. I never knew you. Remember what does Genesis say? Adam knew Eve. Lawlessness is Torahlessness. If we look at the Greek word here, anomia, what does it say? When it says you workers of lawlessness, it says the condition of one without law, either because ignorant of it or because of violating it. In conjunction with lawlessness, we read about the lawless one in scripture. This title in the Blue Letter Bible means destitute of the Mosaic law and departing from the law. Let's see who the lawless one or the one destitute of the Mosaic law works for. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 to 11, the coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by the working of Satan with every kind of power, sign and false wonder. What did we just read? Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast out demons in your name? And with every wicked deception directed against those who are perishing because they refuse the love of the truth that would have saved them. Psalm 119, 142, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your law is truth. Back to verse 11 in 2 Thessalonians. For this reason, God will send them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie in order that judgment may come upon all who have disbelieved the truth, the law, and delighted in wickedness. Ignorance is no excuse when we come to the knowledge of these things. You must come out so you do not contract and share her sins and her plagues. The law of the pertaining, or oh sorry, the law pertaining to the priest whose daughter was burnt for profanity by profaning herself, the harlot. It's actually a genius law because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that's written into the law by the wisdom of our creator to send Babylon the Great, the mother of abominations, to be burnt. That's what that law is for. That's the summary of it. Nowhere else in scripture does the daughter of a priest get burnt except here. She's going to get burnt. Threw in the lake of fire. And one day... She will be burnt with fire and there'll be no remains left of her bones. 
I just want to add there, Jack, as well. Paul says in First Corinthians six sixteen, and I think you mentioned it before. Do you not know <coughs> that the one who joins himself to the harlot is one flesh with the prostitute? Mm. So if you're joining yourself to this harlot, you're one flesh with the prostitute. Yes. There has to be marital language. This is this is the theme of the parsha and, and of the whole word. We're seeing the difference between the maiden and the harlot. We're seeing a difference between the high priest and the beast. It, what, it's beauty in the beast, isn't it? That's what it is. <laughs> this Saturday is the coronation of King Charles, and it has almost been 70 years to the date since the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. What we're about to read next is so relevant for today. You might be thinking, Jack, how does politics come into this? How does UK politics, but this is just not for the UK. This is relevant for the entire world as this, what we're about to read, is biblical prophecy coming true, this coronation. And what's funny is I actually delivered this teaching and then came home to this article and felt compelled to include this part after the fact as this article what we're about to read uncoincidentally lines up with our tour of abortion public invited to swear allegiance to King Charles. People watching the coronation will be invited to join a chorus of millions to swear allegiance to the king and his heirs, organizers say. The public pledge is one of several striking changes to the ancient ceremony revealed on Saturday. In a coronation full of firsts, Female clergy will play a prominent role and the king himself will pray aloud. The Christian service will also see religious leaders from other faiths have an active part for the first time. The coronation on Saturday will be the first to incorporate other languages spoken in Britain with a hymn set to be sung in Welsh, Scottish Gaelic and Irish Gaelic. I mean, this has an anti-Mount Sinai all over it. This has an anti-Pentecost vibes attached to it, an anti-Christ. It has multiple languages, multiple people crying out, swearing allegiance. And those with a keen eye will notice we have the female clergy, the female priest playing a prominent role, while other religious leaders from other faiths have an active part. As they are claiming this is a Christian coronation, this is no other than harlotry and blasphemy, blasphemy. And when does it take place? It takes place on the Sabbath. We couldn't line this more with the scriptures that we've been reading. Let's continue. The public will be given an active role in the ceremony for the first time, with people around the world set to be asked to cry out and swear allegiance to the king. Our hope is at that point when the Archbishop invites people to join in, that people, wherever they are, if they are watching at home, on their own, watching the TV, will say it out loud. This sense of a great cry around the nation and around the world of support for the King. As part of the service, Muslim, Hindu, Jewish and Sikh peers will present the King with pieces of the coronation regalia, including bracelets, the robe, the ring and the glove. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, a practicing Hindu, will read from the biblical book of Colossians. The blessing will be shared by leaders of different Christian denominations for the first time, including the Catholic Cardinal Vincent Nichols. The move reflects Charles' deeply held belief in promoting unity between different faiths through championing interfaith dialogue and celebrating the major religions practiced in the UK. Justin Welby said the coronation was first and foremost an act of Christian worship. I mean, we end the article on vain words saying that this is an act of Christian worship. And if you noticed, the Catholic cardinal will be present. The harlot, we see the trinkets coming out of all the other religions. And we also know the stone of destiny will be present for the coronation that he will sit on. And as we know, and through previous Torah portions, I covered this, that this is said to be Jacob's stone. And even if we don't believe in it, they do. This is the harlotry and blasphemy found in our Torah portion. Harlotry from the priest's daughter and blasphemy 
from the Gentile. It is our Torah portion coming to fulfillment before our eyes. And it's all done in the name of Christianity. 2 Corinthians, for if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, this is a potent scripture as Paul warns us that there can be another Jesus. This service is waved in the banner of Christianity when it couldn't be more far from the truth. This is a multi-faith Christ which can only be in the spirit of the Antichrist. They are claiming this to be a set apart anointing as we can read the screen will hide the sacred act of anointing a monarch with oil with holy oil which can be traced back to the 7th and 8th centuries and signals the monarch has been chosen by god they are stamping god's name on this the first commandment in exodus 20 opens saying you shall have no other gods before me and as we've re read that this is a Christian service, but we will also see religious leaders from other faiths have an act apart for the first time. You see, this is a direct violation against the first commandment to credit something to God, but to have other religions present. They are all in bed together. This is prostituting themselves. Would Moses do this? Would Joshua do this? Would Yeshua do this? It is a lawless service that's taking place. There is no Torah present. And this is why I have a hard time calling myself a Christian. Because they do this in the name of Christianity. This is why I say I'm a Messianic Israelite. Because this Christianity is not the Christianity that I serve. This Yeshua, this Jesus is another Jesus. This is an anti-Christ in opposition of the laws that our Yeshua kept. And I'm not saying that King Charles is the Antichrist. I am careful who I deem. Although, as written in 1 John, there will be many Antichrists. However, there is no doubt this ceremony is working in the spirit of the Antichrist and has the whore of Babylon, the harlot and the lawless one all over it. Can you tell the time, beloved? On the screen is an approximate timeline from Adam to the present day. It is calculated by adding up the age that is recorded of the patriarchs given in the Bible, along with significant recorded events. It is based on the Hebrew Mesoretic text, and this is a timeline that can be found in the Creation Museum in Kentucky. And I'm not saying that this calendar is completely accurate i'm aware of many other calendars such as the jewish calendar nor am i trying to set an exact date for judgment day with this calendar however one similarity all the calendars have in common is that we are approaching the end of the sixth day as we can see on this calendar we're approaching the end of that sixth day we're coming up to it we're leading up to it in the calendar, we read that it's 5,977 years since Adam. And even if this is an approximate number, it's so close now. And I believe when we hit 6,000 years, it is the beginning of the seventh day. Whenever that will be, but we know it is so close. This is where Yeshua will reign for a thousand years, according to the book of Revelation, when we hit... 6,000 years and move into that 6,000 to 7,000. That is the seventh day, as you can see in the timeline. And this will be the first resurrection where only the bride will be resurrected. The text we are about to read in Revelation now says those who, are, who have been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus, which I believe means those who have their head counted, those who have had their atonement tax paid for, are going to be resurrected by the one who paid that atonement tax, the bridegroom. This is speaking of the bride. Let's read it, Revelation 20 from verse 4. Then I saw the thrones, and those seated on them had been given authority to judge. 
and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or hands, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the millennial kingdom. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until a thousand years were complete. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. When a thousand years are complete, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to assemble them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the seashore. Reading on. And they marched across the broad expanse of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, into which the beast and the false prophet had already been thrown. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. We read in scripture the judgment of those who betray God is fire coming down from heaven and the devil, the beast and the false prophet will be thrown into the lake of fire. This is the same judgment as the priest's daughter who was a harlot to be burned with fire. This is how it is relevant to our Torah portion and I believe the devil and his demonic have always been, out, been about harlotry. Since the serpent and Eve in the garden, to the angels going into the daughters of men, to the worshippers of Baal, now to this multi-faith antichrist, it is the same spirit and it all has the same judgment, which is of fire. And this is why many are returning back to the Sabbath. They can feel the millennial kingdom approaching. They can feel the seventh day approaching the 6,000 year. They can see the end of the sixth day. They can see the sun is setting. It is getting dark in this world. But when Yeshua comes back, he will be the light of this world. And we know the Feast of Tabernacles will be kept in the Millennial Kingdom according to Zechariah 14. Read Zechariah 14, check it out. This is where Yeshua will rule. The feasts are just as relevant today as they are going to be, even more so in the future. Can you tell the time, beloved? Can you tell what is being set out before you on this stage? This is already written about. And as it is written, Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 18. I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feasts. They came from you, O Zion. The reproach of exile is a burden on them. This is such a beautiful chapter and is all about the king returning to a faithful remnant that has persisted through the generations. He is going to gather those who want to keep his feasts in the millennial kingdom. He is going to gather those who want to keep the seventh day, the 7,000 year. Yeshua's second coming is at our doorsteps. And he is going to gather those who want to keep his feasts. He is going to gather the bride. To end, I have a few scriptures of recompense. And this on the screen is taken from the epistle of Barnabas, so please take it with a pinch of salt. It isn't the Holy Scriptures, but I thought it summarises the Parsha quite well. And that this, these verses are in line um, with the word. I'm not saying the whole epistle is, but I'm saying this rings pretty true to me, these verses. So it's from the epistle of Barnabas. Give heed, children, what this meaneth. He ended in six days... He meaneth this, that in 6,000 years the Lord shall bring all things to an end, for a day with him signifieth a thousand years. And this he himself beareth me witness, saying, Behold, 
the day of the Lord shall be as a thousand years. Therefore, children, in six days, that is six thousand years, everything shall come to an end. And he rested on the seventh day. This he meaneth, when his son shall come and shall abolish the time of the lawless one and shall judge the ungodly and shall change the sun and the moon and the stars, then shall he truly rest on the seventh day. The calendar that we've looked at, as much as these try and change the times, it's written literally in the stars. And on the seventh day, as it says, the sun and the moon and the stars, they will change because he's here then. We no longer need the scroll in the sky. In Book of Revelation, it says the scroll rolls up when he returns. We no longer need that prophetic message in the sky. It's been telling us for 6,000 years. <laughs> it's been speaking to us. It's been crying out to us. The stars have been literally singing for 6,000 years. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 5. For as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. And lastly, Revelation 14, 4. These are the ones who had not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves ch chastened. These, chase, these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and mm. to the Lamb. Hallelujah. Abba Yah. Father, we pray for everyone who is in the church system, Father. We pray, Father, that they will recognise the harlotry that's taken place, that they will have their eyes open to the deception, Father, of the Council of La Laodicea, Father, that set up these traditions of men to change your clock. And so many people have forgotten how to tell the time, Father. But Father, we remember your ways. Let us tell the time, Father, and let us honour the timepiece you've put in the heavens. Let us not work on the Sabbath or make others work. Let us not buy or sell on the Sabbath no longer. Let us contend for the faith. Let us shamar, let us guard, let us keep this commandment, Father. You saved us before we was observing the Sabbath, Father. And you're going to save people from now till then who don't observe the Sabbath. But Father, when we come into the fullness of your scroll, when you reveal our mysteries, don't allow us to return back to our vomit. Don't allow us to go and work on this day and make it common. Let us not profane this day. Let us hold held it in the highest esteem as one day you will be ruling in the millennial kingdom from this day. And if we can't serve you now, how are we going to serve you then? If we can't love you now, how are we going to love you then? I ask for the revelation, Father, of more churches in Liverpool, mm. in Merseyside, mm. in the UK, across the world, Father, I pray. I pray for those who are out there who are alone, who may not be able to congregate on the Sabbath, Father. I pray that you show them their closest fellowship, that you, st you stir up a sojourn in their hearts to have a holy convocation. We thank you, Abiyah. We thank you for this beautiful timepiece, this work of art that you've given to us, that we only have to lift our heads up and look up as our redemption draws near. I pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen.